pray. Good morning again, everybody. How we doing? I feel like we need to shift gears here. All right. And uh, yeah, it's it's a beautiful day outside. Happy Mother's Day to all you moms. We're glad that you're here to celebrate with us, and and we're gonna we're gonna um, talk about that a little bit. I, I wanna I wanna talk. To you today. We've been in a series um, called Victorious, and and I want to talk to you about what it means to be victorious. Because I, I think sometimes we we get in we can get in a mindset of being a victim. And and when we get in that mindset of being a victim, It sucks us in. It's 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 magnetic, <laughs> and, and it and it pulls us in and it holds us. And then, if we're not careful, we can end up becoming comfortable in that place of being a victim. Because the truth is, it gives us an excuse, right? It gives us some excuse to not to not be able to uh, to do what we know we're supposed to be able to do, and to experience the victory that we're supposed to experience. And we get. And we can get stuck in that. And the last thing that I think God wants for us is to be stuck in that place. When he has provided all that could ever be necessary for us to have victory over it, he would never want us to be stuck in that place. And so I I, want to talk to you about that today. And and I want to, we're going to, we're going to, dig a little deep into a portion of scripture um, that, that honestly I think has, can, can and has been misunderstood um, often and, and, and many, many times because, well, you'll see why. I'll, I'll, I'll let you figure out why. But up to this point, in this series, we, we've been going through the book of Romans, and in this series, we've covered uh, chapter 6 and, and going into chapter 7 of, of the book of Romans. And, and up to this point, we've seen that Jesus has done all that is necessary to save us and to set us free from sin, right? We, we've, we saw in, in Romans 6 that, that we are no longer slaves to sin, that we died to sin, how could we live in it any longer, that we are victorious in Christ, that we've been set free. When the Son has set you free, you are free indeed, right? And so it's in that freedom that we want to, that, that we want to be able to live, and that's where the problem happens. That's where, they, as they say, that's where the rub is, right? That's that's where it gets hard because it's one thing to say I'm free in Christ. It's one, say, one thing to say that I have victory in Christ. And then it's another thing to actually live your life and to go through your life and, and, and experience the attacks, experience the temptations, experience the trouble and the struggle that comes against us uh, when life begins to happen. And it's there that we have to think rightly. And, and, if we're, and if we're able to think correctly in that moment, in that place, then, then we're able to, then we're able to, to actually apply the scripture that, that gives us what we need. And so when the problem comes, when I try to walk in that freedom, I can say that I am free from the law and that I'm, that, but, but, when I, but when I say it, I still feel guilty when I sin, right? Or I can say that I am dead to sin and I'm free from it, but then I still have the temptation and, and, and it still comes against me. And, and, and what do I do with that? And how do I live in that? So this is the struggle that I think the Apostle Paul is getting at. And, and in, in Romans chapter 7, he describes a state he, he describes a scenario that, that um, honestly, I think we, we sometimes misunderstand because, frankly, we want to, because we like the fact that maybe he struggled with it. But I don't think that's the case. And, and so in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, he talks about a struggle. 
And, and the, the, the title of the sermon today is, is freedom, is victorious over, from the struggle. Victorious from the struggle. Because here's what I believe, that if you are in Christ, this struggle that he's describing is not yours. It does not belong to you. Don't own it. Okay? Because when, when we become prisoners, you, there's two ways to become a prisoner. You can either become a prisoner because someone has authority over you and put you in prison, or you can become a prisoner because you walked in a prison cell and you slammed the door behind you and you sat down and you sulked about being a prisoner, right? Because we become prisoners of our own choosing, our own making, sometimes simply because it's easier than just being free. And that's the struggle that I'm telling you that I don't think is ours. And so I, I want to I wanna just jump into this and, and we'll, we'll climb our way out once we get in there deep, okay? Romans chapter 7, the first half of it, he basically uses the first half to summarize what we have studied over the last few chapters. So I'm not going to cover that again. Um, and, but, but basically, I can try to summarize it for you. What he's saying is that if you are in Christ, if you have placed your faith in Christ, if you have received the free gift of salvation through Christ, then you are free from sin you are set free from the penalty of death. You are no longer a slave to sin. And because of the power of Christ in your life, you have power over sin. Okay? Everybody that's been here with me agree that's what we've studied over the last few chapters, right? So it's in that freedom that we then come into this next piece of scripture that I think sometimes we misunderstand. We misunderstand it because we think that the Apostle Paul is talking about his current state of life, the way that he lives. And so we read in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Now here's the first clue. If we are in Christ, are we sold as a slave to sin? No. No. We are no longer slaves to sin. We have been set free from sin, right? So we can't, it can't be applying to us. So all of your study Bibles that say in the little notes down in the bottom, I disagree. They're just wrong if they say that that is applying to his current state of life or to ours as Christians because we can't be sold as a slave to sin if Christ has rescued us from being sold as a slave to sin. He's talking about a past condition if you are in Christ. If you are not in Christ, if you haven't received Christ as your Savior, if you haven't received his gift of grace, then he is talking about your condition that you are in right now and you no longer have to live in that condition because Christ is offering you his, himself as a free gift, his payment on the cross for your sin so that you can be set free. Verse 15, he says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, I no long, I, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. Now, here's the problem. If you are in Christ, do you have sin living in you? The answer is no, right? Because he just said back in Romans 6, when we were baptized, we, were, we did what? We died to sin. How can it, we live in it any longer? And sin is dead to us, and we are dead to sin. It, it's separated from us. That's what death means. Death means a separation, right? And so we are separated from it. Now, Here's the problem, and here's the reason that we sometimes want to relate to this because we feel like, well, but wait a minute, <laughs> I still feel temptation to sin, and I even still sin from time to time, and, and I still experience that struggle that's going on, and I, here's what I'm telling you. The struggle is there, but don't own it. The struggle is not yours. Through Christ, you, have, you are victorious from the struggle. The struggle doesn't belong to you, even though it may still be there. Let's keep reading. In verse 18, he says, For I know the good itself 
I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. If you are in Christ, if you are a believer, sin is no longer living in you, so it is no longer sin that does it. One of the dangers in this passage, in in misunderstanding this passage, is the fact that we will sometimes use this as as an excuse and we say, well, it's no longer, it's not, the devil made me do it. Anybody ever heard that? The devil made me do it. L- listen to, listen, Christian, believer, follower of Christ, recipient of grace. The devil can't make you do anything. He has no power over you. You are dead to sin, alive in Christ. You are victorious over sin. There is nothing that the devil can do to make you do anything because the devil is powerless against you because of who is in you. When he says the, the sin that's living in me, listen, sin can't live in you if the Holy Spirit lives in you. They can't coexist. They do not dwell together. You follow me? So we can't use, we have to understand, this passage is the Apostle Paul speaking almost sarcastically about the way he used to live. And a believer that still takes on the struggle, that still owns the struggle and says, oh, but this is just the cross I have to bear. You're taking scripture way out of context when you say that. The cross you bear has nothing to do with sin. The cross you bear is the free gift of grace that on the cross, Jesus Christ paid the price for you to have victory. And the cross that you bear is not a burden. It is a strength to you. I wear the cross as as a mantle of victory over sin and death. That's the cross that we bear. It has nothing to do with struggling under some kind of burden. Oh, well, I just got to suffer through this life. No, we are more than conquerors in Christ. The rest of Scripture does not make sense if we misunderstand this piece of Scripture, right? That I am no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer a victim under the, the, the whims of the devil and, and whatever he wants to throw at me and, and the temptation that comes at me. There is no temptation that is common to, no, to, to everyone. It's common to us all. Everyone is tempted. What we do with that temptation is, is what is then determines the condition of our hearts. So he says in Verse 21, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. I am no longer a prisoner so it can't make me a prisoner. I'm no longer under law, so I can't be, so this cannot apply to me when it, as a believer, as a, as a follower of Christ, right? So what, what he's describing is what we see in our past, what we see in our rearview mirror. The problem is that many of us are stuck in the struggle and we stare in the rearview mirror trying to move forward and we get nowhere because we need to take our eyes off the past. Remember a few weeks ago when I talked about the focus. Where you focus is where you will go. When you train a a, a race car driver driving at 180 miles an hour, that race car driver needs to have focus, right? And he needs to only focus on where he's going, where he wants to go. So they train a race car driver, never look at the car you're trying to pass and never look at the wall because what you look at is what you, is where you're going to go. Always look at the space between. Look at the hole between the car you want to pass and the wall and that's where you will go because if whatever you look at is what you will hit. 
And if we focus on what is in our past, if we're constantly sitting around, oh, I'm a, this is such a struggle, uh, spiritual warfare, is just, you know, the devil's just beating me up, the devil's just attacking me on us. Listen, take your eyes off the struggle. Take your eyes off the battle. The battle does not belong to you. The battle belongs to the Lord. You take your eyes off the struggle and you put your eyes on the one who has already defeated all your enemies for you. Get your eyes out of the rearview mirror and put them in the windshield. God never gives us a command to look back. He gives us a command to go forward. And it's in the going forward that we get to experience the victory. It doesn't matter what the struggle is that you're up against. It doesn't matter what the battle is that you're up against. The more attention you give to the struggle, the stronger it gets. I'm telling you that when you do battle against it, you will win. And here's, here, here's the rub. The Apostle Paul couldn't hold it anymore. He says this, what, what a wretched man am I? And I think he's really being sarcastic here. Right? He's like, oh, poor little me. Oh, what a wretched man am I? Who will save me? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? If you are in Christ, are you subject to death? Haven't we just learned that you're no, no longer subject to death when you are in Christ? So this can't mean, this can't apply to, the, to, the, to the, the saved one. It can't apply to a Christian. It can't apply to the Apostle Paul. Who will save me? And then he says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is our deliverer, so we are no longer stuck. We are no longer slaves. We are no longer imprisoned. We are no longer powerless against the things that come against us. We are empowered in Christ. It is through Christ that we have power and victory. And it's in that victory that we have to live, that we, that we get to live. And it's as we, as we live that out and we experience that, then we get to be a part of it. Last week I talked about, I talked about a, a, an inner part of us. And, and he, he talks about that in this passage back in verse 22. In, in verse 22, he kind of gives us an insight to where he's, ta where he's coming from. And he says, for in my inner being, right, that's very important. In my inner being, I delight in God's law. It's in that inner being, my heart, my spirit, is what we will call what, what is called in the in the Bible. It can also be translated my heart. It's in my heart, in my spirit, in my inner being. I delight in God's law. That's where I want to do what is good. It's, it's where I want to say no to what is bad. It's where I want to be close. It's where I connect with God. Right? But he says this. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind. Now remember last week we talked about this verse, this 1 Thessalonians 5.23, where it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we said that there's a, a very important reason that he breaks those three down. Spirit, soul, and body. Because they are three, there are, there, there are three parts of who we are as one person. And, and we have our spirit who is, that is the innermost part of us. That is what is known as the heart or the in, innermost being. That's the part of us where you can't lie to you, where, where you know the truth, right? Where, where, you, where even, you, you might be able to deceive yourself on a body level or on, even on a soul level, but you will not deceive yourself on a heart level. You know whether it's true or not, Right? And people say stuff like, well, trust your gut or, you know, trust your heart. That's because there's a part in us where we know. 
It's the part of us that connects with God. And, and then there's the soul part of us. That's the part in between. That's the part where our mind is, where our consciousness is, where our conscience is, where we feel, where we feel emotions and we, and we, we feel... And then there's the body. And the body is our outward part. It's the physical part of us. And it's the part that is the first line of defense. It's the target, right? It's the target for temptation. When temptation comes at us, what does it come at? It comes at our flesh, right? Our body. That, that's where it comes. And, and when it gets through that first line of defense, then it runs into the soul. And it's in the soul where we have to do something with it. Where we have to do something with it. Because if we don't do something with it, if we're not careful with it in our soul, it will ultimately get into our heart. Into our spirit. And when we allow something, when we, when we process something in a way that allows it to get into our spirit, it becomes a part of us and what we do. That's why a f a f Proverbs 423 says this, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Now I'm going to break into this deep, dark, hardcore thought here and we're going to celebrate Mother's Day a little bit. So all you moms, Brandon, where are you? And, and whoever you asked to help would you come on? Would all the moms, if you're able to, stand up? If, you, if you're not able to, just raise your hand. And, and we would like to give all the moms a little gift. And, and give the moms a hand. How about it? We love our moms. And we have a, have a heart for you that has a little reminder on there. This says Proverbs 4.23. Because Proverbs 4.23 reminds us as moms, reminds us as human beings, as every person, that we must guard our heart, guard that inmost place that you, uh, 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 where you are, because that is who you become. It's what you do. So we want to we want to remember moms. We want to celebrate moms. But we also want to protect our moms. Amen. So moms, thank you. Sit down. Give moms a hand again. One more time. Did every mom get a heart? Make sure you get a heart. There's a, there's a great couple of passages of scripture in Luke chapter 2 that remind us uh, about a mom. Because I think moms... Does anybody watch the Goldbergs? Anybody? Two of us. All right. So t two or three of us is going to get this joke. Okay? But, but there's a show on TV called the Goldbergs, and there's a coach on there. He is the, the epitome of the stereotypical high school gym teacher. That, that is just fantastic character, but, but uh, he, he says something that I, that, that I think m it just resonated with me. And so he, says, he says to one of the kids, the Goldberg kids, he says, you Goldbergs, you Goldbergs feel hard. What he meant was, he meant when you feel something, you really feel it right? You really take it down deep and you really feel it on, on a heart level. And, and I think when, when we talk to moms, when, you, when, when you're talking about mothers, you talk about um, someone, when it comes to your kids, you feel hard, right? You feel, it, you feel deep and, and, you, and it can go down deep inside. And, and, and there's a, when, when you think about a mom in the Bible, who do we think about immediately? Who do we think? Mary, of course, we think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I think there's a couple of demonstrations, there's more than this, but there's a couple in Luke chapter 2 that, that demonstrate what Mary did that I think was important. 
In, in Luke chapter 2, when, when uh, Jesus has just been born, he's still there in the manger, and, and uh, the shepherds have come from out in, out in the field. They've seen the angels, and they've come to worship him, and, and there's all this hustle and bustle going on, and there's animals around, and there's craziness going on, and, and Mary is there with Jesus, and all this is happening, and Mary looks at Jesus. She sees everything that's happening, and, 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 and the scripture says it this way, But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. She took all the things in this moment. Even the things that she didn't understand. She was probably scared to death. She probably was confused. Didn't know what was happening. And, and, but, but, but she took this moment in. And she pondered it in her heart. And it became a part of her. There's another part at the end of this same chapter where Jesus is jump, jump forward about 12 years later. 12 years later, Jesus is, uh, has gone with his whole family from where they live to Jerusalem and, and they've celebrated the feast and, they, and, and, and they're on their way back and Mary and Joseph about a day out on their way back home from Jerusalem realize that Jesus is not with them. Right? Now, this doesn't speak to their parenting skills. <laughs> that they left their kid for like a day in Jerusalem while they traveled back home. Uh, they realized what was going on, so they traveled another day back to Jerusalem to try to find him. It, it says, the scripture says about three days later, so at least four days, they've been looking, they've been without Jesus, they, they've been looking for him, and finally they find him in the temple. And he's in the temple and he's talking to the scholars and they're, and, and, and they're all amazed at his wisdom. And, and, and even at a young age, he's 12 years old and, and they're confused. <laughs> and and Mary, says, Mary says what only a mother would say. Why did you do this to me? Right? She takes it very personal because moms take things personal, right? It's a, it's a part of it. It's a part of feeling hard. When you feel things hard, you take things personal and, and, it, and it cuts deep. And so Mary is like, she's not happy, right? And, and so she's like, why did you do this to me? And, and, and Jesus gives her an answer. And, and I think it's just an important. It says... <laughs> Jesus says, why, why were you searching for me? Duh, right? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And this is important. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. This is Mary. <laughs> this is Mary, the one who was virgin. Like, she became pregnant as a virgin she knew that was a miracle, right? She was there. She, she's the one who the angel came and told, this is the son of God who you are going to give birth to. You will call him Emmanuel, God with us. This is the one who she has seen all these miraculous events happen around and, and she still doesn't completely understand what is happening. But I think the next part, is important. Then he went down to, to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. He said his mother treasured all these things in her heart because moms feel hard <laughs> and because these things can get into your heart and, and you know, the first part has the potential. It's, 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 you know, he's just been born. It's a warm, it's a beautiful moment. The second one has the potential, if processed incorrectly, to, to become a negative. He, he was basically, from her perspective, disobedient disrespectful to her she says why'd you do this to me she could have processed that and allowed it to become malice in her heart and allowed it to become a stumbling block between her and her son but all indications in scripture she didn't do that she understood that he was that he was up to something that she didn't get but she was 
willing to unconditionally love him anyway. And, and, and I, that's, a, that's a part that I think is important for our purpose today is what do you treasure in your heart? And what do you allow to get through your soul into your heart? How you process what happens around you, how you process the information and the events that come at you will determine what gets down into your heart. And if we're not careful to guard our hearts, as the heart says, right? Proverbs 4.23, I think I have one in my pocket. There. Proverbs 4.23, when I guard my heart and, I, and I'm careful of what I let in it, what it does is it determines what comes out of me. Because from the heart flows everything. So I just want two quick points. Number one, guard what goes in your heart. Guard what you let into your heart. What comes at your body, you cannot control, right? What happens to you around you and what ha uh, has the potential to get into your heart and become a part of you if you're not careful. You can't decide what happens to you on a body level, on a physical level. You can't always, now you can by not going to certain places, not putting yourself in certain situations or whatever, but it, in large part, we don't really control or have any uh, influence over all the things that come at us. What we do have control over is how we process those things. And we process those things that come at our body, on that level, in our soul, in our mind, in the way that we think about them, in the way that we use our thoughts. And so the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 10, he says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What this means is that when we when things happen to us, when events happen to us, when, when, when hurt comes in, when disappointment comes in, when sin tries to come in, whatever it is that tries to come in, we have to guard. We have to be on guard on the soul level to guard our thoughts. And don't allow, don't allow that thought to begin to play itself over and over again in your mind. And, and to start to say things in your mind that you know is not of God right? Things that lead to worry and anxiety and fear. Things that lead to anger and, and resentment and malice. Those things are not of God. Those things must be guarded against. You say, but they made me mad or they hurt me or they let me down. Or you say, well, I'm scared and I'm worried. I understand that and that's fine and that's normal. That's natural. You are not called as a believer and follower of Christ to live a natural life. You are called to live a supernatural life empowered by the Holy Spirit of God that is over all and in all and through all and has power over everything that sets itself up as a pretension against us. So we have a defense. We demolish every argument, every stronghold, everything that comes against us. Why? Because it guards our heart. You say, well, I don't want to let them off the hook. Well, you're not letting them off the hook. You're letting you off the hook. Listen, forgiveness is not for, you, for them. It's for you. We don't forgive people for their sake. We forgive people for our sake so that it doesn't get through our soul, down into our heart, and then come back up out of us as malice and all those other bad words that it could be. Right? Are you, are you with me? This is how you protect your heart. You must protect your heart regardless of what comes at you. Process it correctly in a godly way with the Holy Spirit as your helper, as your guide, as your protector, and you will safeguard your heart. It's in the heart from where all life springs. And so when we, number two, 
What about the other direction? If we guard our hearts and we fill our hearts with God, we fill our hearts with scripture, we fill our hearts with what we, listen, just one more quick thing on the, on the whole idea. I, I, I had this illustration here. You know, I've, we've been sick in our house forever and it's just, it's just ridiculous. And, and, uh, I just thought, this is hilarious, right? I mean, a hand sanitizer this big, this has to be turned into some sort of joke illustration or something. But, you know, I just thought, you know, what we want to do when we put hand sanitizer on is, is we want to take this stuff here and, and we put it on here so that we can create a hostile environment on our hands for germs, right? Right? Because we don't want germs to get in, so we want to create a hostile envir- environment for those germs to get in so that we are protected from them. Okay, so just like lathering up with this, you know, big giant hand sanitizer thing, it, it creates a hostile environment for germ- germs. Can't, 99.9% of germs cannot, <laughs> will not live on my hands now. Okay, so we can shake hands on the way out and and 99.9% will not make it. If the 0.1% makes it, then I'm sorry. But that's just, that's what it says right there. 99.99% is what it says. Here's what I believe. What I believe is is that if if you will fill up your heart with the love of God, if you will fill up your heart with scripture, if you will fill up your heart with prayer and connected with with God, if you will fill up your heart with connecting with other believers and coming together and serving together and loving each other together, if you will fill your heart with that, then it will fill up and well up to overflowing to where the, the, the power of what is coming up out of your heart and out of you will be stronger than the temptation and junk that's trying to come into you. It's just like putting two water hoses together that are flowing in opposite directions. Guess what? which one's going to win? The one that's flowing the hardest, right? The one that has the most power going is the one that's going to win. And that's how your heart is. Is your heart flowing out with the things of God as strong as the stuff of the world is flowing in? Because if you will If you will allow, if you will fill yourself up and guard your thoughts, guard your reaction, guard how you process what happens around you, give it over to God, just hand it right back over to him. Don't let it go seeping down into your heart and contaminating your your mind and and your way of living and your way of being. You will be preserved. And what flows out of you will be stronger than that which tries to flow into you. Jesus said, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Where does spirit and truth come from? Spirit and truth comes from the heart. It's found in the heart. It's found in your spirit. So above all else, guard your heart. Amen?